Hello and welcome to Concert Pipeline. I'm Steve Jones. Uh, today on the program, we have a band called Heavy Guts. Uh, now, you may not have heard of them, but uh, they have a great new album that, uh, that I really recommend. Uh, their story is a lot of fun. We had a blast talking. I mean, I, I had a chance to talk to the whole band. Uh, Dorota and uh, Stell were, um, they're married and they were uh, on the same video uh, from uh, down in Los Angeles. And Ryan, was, uh, uh, the other member of the band, was separate from uh, Arizona. So uh, so they were on separate video screens and it was just, it was incredible. I mean, it, toward the end, it just got completely silly. Uh, I'm gonna have to do some editing on it because the audio got a little choppy on one, one side with point fingers. But I will say that I have never had an interview uh, in the location where uh, this interview ended. Uh, and I will leave it at that for those that are watching on YouTube. Uh, for those that are listening on Apple Podcasts or Stitcher, uh, then I'm sorry, you're going to have to go to YouTube to find out a little bit more about what I mean by that statement. Uh, so really, really fun interview. And uh, before we get into that, I mean, there's so much to catch up on, but I can't really talk too much about it because it's going to be saved for a separate pod. There's going to be a nostalgia pod, uh, ultimately, Steve's nostalgia pod uh, that, that comes out, which, uh, I mean, just to tease it a little bit, that it will include an interview with Everclear, uh, coverage of Smash Mouth, and um, Motion City Soundtracks, uh, commit this to memory, 17th anniversary tour, all in one episode. So you have that to look forward to in the coming weeks. Uh, but... Uh, lots of great stories tied to that. I mean, that's been my life for the last week, really. So there's not much more I could say beyond uh, beyond that for that, uh, other than it's hot these days. Uh, I'm doing a lot of digging in the backyard, digging up uh, uh, old dead grass. And that is tiring and exhausting uh, to, to my body. Uh, but, uh, but it's also rewarding to see the progress. And I'm doing it myself because I'm a damn homeowner. Uh, now and uh, and that's what you do when you're a homeowner. You try and do the stuff yourself before, rather than pay people to do it for you. We're going to charge you a lot more. Um, so it's going to take me probably five or six weeks to finish the whole backyard, uh, digging up all the dead grass there, and then I'm going to put in some mulch. And this is really exciting stuff for a concert podcast, by the way. Uh, but it is an, it is for me in terms of. Uh, me putting in the effort and taking pride in my home. Um, I find that there's still areas that I kind of treat it like I'm a renter because I've been a renter my whole life into the last you know couple months. And uh, and there's things I can, you know haven't committed to getting rid of that were left here from the previous owner uh, and other things I should do. And this wall over here uh, needs to it needs to have my Fillmore posters on it, my concert posters uh, framed, which I haven't framed them yet. Um, that's an expensive process, but I've held on to Fillmore posters that I've gotten over the decades, and um, and that would be a good wall for that. I, I you know I, I came to that conclusion, but that's going to take some time. So in in the future, you'll probably see some art show up there um, on that wall uh, from concerts because it's my house and I can do what I want. Yeah, that's right. You hear that, kids? It's, it's Daddy's house. All right. Uh, <laughs> uh, so. That is kind of what's going on right now. Summer is flying by. Um, I'm looking forward to a camping trip that I have uh, at the end of the month with the kids and my buddy Joe and his son and dog. Uh, they're all going to be we're going to be camping together up on the coast, uh, so which should be fun. Um, and uh, and then they're off to Hawaii. His family uh, and so and I'm going to be watching his dog for a week. I think um, after that. So. Uh, that's what's going on in Steve's world. That's the story. Uh, I don't want to wait any longer because this interview is a lot of fun. I really recommend sticking around. Um, and uh, there's a tie into the Lumineers with this interview in that Stealth uh, is actually in the band, the Lumineers. And, uh, and Ryan's, uh, I think he said it was his girlfriend. Or no, it's his wife. Excuse me. His wife, Lauren, is also in the Lumineers. Um, so that's how they kind of know each other through through that dynamic, and they decide to make some music together, build a band. We'll let them tell the story. So, uh, all right, let's go ahead and let's bring in Heavy Gus. Hey, how's it going? Stealth, right? It is stealth. Hello, how are you? I am doing good. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Your name again? 
My name is Steve. Steve, okay. Pleasure. Here. Yeah, we might... You want to go in the backyard? Let's go in the backyard. Yeah. We're going to go in the backyard. And maybe our laptop won't overtake. No. My phone just overheated trying to text out here. It's like 105. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's hot where I am too. I, you know, it's it's gross. <laughs> hey, hey, how's it going? Uh, Ryan, can you can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. Hi. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Uh, thank you. Thank you guys for taking the time. By the way, like, and by the way, the visual. Uh, I like the backyard. The, the cloud is so perfectly placed. It's a, uh, it, you know, it's a great setting. So <laughs> yeah, we hired the cloud. You did, of course. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, I'm sure it's it comes at a, a great cost, but well worth the, the investment. So thanks. Th yeah, um, Ryan, um, how are you doing today? And uh, uh, Dorota as well. Tell, uh, tell me how you guys are doing. I am doing great. I just went swimming. I'm in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, and that felt really good. And then I got my Arizona driver's license, which I've been dragging my feet on. I've been living here since October and finally yeah, got baby. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's good. And then I, uh, I head to LA tomorrow to, to meet these other two fine folk. <laughs> Excellent. I hear it's really hot in LA. I can only imagine how hot it is in Arizona. So it's not that bad here. I mean, it's hot, mm. but like 93, which is. Uh, well, that sounds it, lovely. Yeah, it's hotter <laughs> other places. It's hotter in Oregon. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm up in, uh, in the Bay Area. It's like 100 degrees where I am, too. So uh, yeah, outside of Sacramento. So uh, we can, we're all feeling the heat. But uh, we're here today to talk about Heavy Gus uh, and uh, and the new album, of course, and uh, and your history as a band. Um, what brought you guys together? I'm also interested in kind of your your upbringing in music as as well. So we'll get into all of the all of that fun stuff. Um, but uh, but let's start with kind of the uh, the band and kind of how you guys came together. And obviously, uh, Stealth and uh, Dorota, you two are married, so there's kind of a connection there. I'd say, right? There's a little bit of a connection there, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then um, my partner, my fiance, is in the Lumineers with Stell. And so uh, Dorota and I were spending a lot of time together backstage at Lumineers concerts, um, which was great. We love being, uh, you know, supportive spouses, but then- It's really easy to be supportive spouses with great hospitality backstage. Yeah. <laughs> but we also feel like, Remember playing music? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we sort of, uh, yeah, kind of kicked the idea around um, of having a little little side band because uh, Dorota had a bunch of songs and then um, Stealth also had a bunch of songs. And then kind of early in the pandemic, they asked if I wanted to go record an album with them in Nashville. And at first I thought it was just gonna be like record the album. Um, but then the album was so much fun to make that we like, you know, we made it permanent. Yeah. Like, yeah cause... Are we a band? Yeah. We're a band. <laughs> yeah. 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 So so that idea wasn't even in the in the cards at first. It was just like, you know what? We uh we need to make some music or we're, we're gonna get in the studio. We have this uh this great studio lined up. Let's make it happen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, a lot of things happened in in reverse order. Um, like a booking agent was like, hey, if you guys start a band, I'll book you. And then we recorded the album and we still weren't really sure that we were a band. And then uh, we finally yeah. got some rehearsals in right before we were about to play our first show. So recently. Recently. <laughs> yeah. After after the album, I mean, this is rare, yes, and I, I think we're fortunate, but I, uh, we've all been in so many different projects, and um, I think that's the only way that it, it was able to happen in reverse, is we've all made these connections. And yeah, and we've, like, played music for so long, we've all been in a bunch of different bands, and so it was a new project, but also 
we're all like established musicians. I almost think we went in, sometimes I think, did we go in kind of cocky where we're like, oh, we've been in so many bands, this will be easy. And then you're actually getting into uh, the space where you're like, wait, how do we, do, how do you like banter in between songs of a band that doesn't exist? These things that you don't think of exactly that don't come second nature, even though, you know, we've all done this in so many ways. Are you talking shit on my banter? No. <laughs> Uh-oh. Do you, do you, are you, do you have some banter fun in, in the shows to go? Uh, we got in banter trouble the other day. Yeah. Uh, fourth, fifth show ever. In, in New York. York. We were playing before um, mm. Paris Jackson, who also happens to be Michael Jackson's daughter. And I just tried to mention to the crowd, it was a slot show, you know, where they kick everybody out after we play, and then they bring in a whole new crowd to watch her. So I was like, hey, everybody, you know, you're going to have to get swept out of here as soon as we're done playing. But I think if you like our music, because the way Dorota sings, you know, we have these punk influences. Paris Jackson also has this kind of punk influence. We were watching and, her sound uh, check and we were like, oh, our band is not so different. Yeah, I was like, oh, this is kind of a good fit. What a shame that they're going to kick our, our entire audience out and reset. Um, so I said, if you guys feel like paying again and coming back in, if you're apprehensive, don't worry. Her music sounds way more like ours than Michael Jackson's. That was my joke and then someone yelled why don't you just shut you know they started screaming at me and they took it serious they took it serious in a way that uh they were i think a deep michael jackson fan um you sound like a dick yeah, yeah. Well. yeah. <laughs> and i was like no 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 like i like both i'm just saying you know if you like us then i think you'll also like the next band and she's like shut the hell up and someone else is like why don't you shut the hell up and then i was like gonna be an all-out brawl Somebody tried to take the lady out of there who was too drunk. It was very fun for me who uh, I live in like a cow town and I spend a lot of time uh, being a mom lately. Yeah. Uh, and so it was very fun to be playing a show in New York and then have people yelling at each other. I was just on stage <laughs> beaming like, yes, this is so fun. <laughs> this is what it's all about. And you don't want to mess with Paris Jackson's bands, by the way. So. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, no, that's no, good. Yeah, so so let me t kind of get a little insight into your musical background and kind of how you got started. Like for for each of you, um, what was the vibe in your household growing up, and what did you listen to? Um, no one in my family is musicians, but my dad is a music appreciator of the classic rock variety. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of Pink Floyd, um, which actually like, took me a long time to appreciate. Um, but I also grew up doing Polish folk dancing. I'm Polish and I did Polish folk singing and dancing for like 10 years growing up. Um, so there's a lot of that tucked into my subconscious. Did some singing in church that's in there some. <laughs> you know, now that you're saying it out loud, I really like that uh, every po Polish folk song has kind of this uh, miraculously wild and um, unyielding melody, but deep down the lyrics are the most depressing thing you've ever heard. <laughs> and I kind of think that is similar to the music you write. Aww. So that Polish yeah. folk music really did influence you in the best and okay. best ways. <laughs> <laughs> we have a um, one-year-old right now uh right now <laughs> congratulations <laughs> yes. funny to say. but my mom always sings him like polish folk songs uh -huh. um, and i'll listen to her sing them and they're all like and the cat got drunk and he went to the doctor and he wasn't gonna make it <laughs> they're all just like so dark <laughs> like, poor cat children yeah <laughs> but wow. yeah how about you still I grew up, uh, you know, my mom was suckered into the BMG deal. Mm -hmm. uh, no offense. Like uh, us? BMG. Hey, whoa. <laughs> uh, just kidding, just kidding. Our album was being cut out by BMG in one month. Thank you, BMG. Thank They're you, BMG. fantastic. I remember how BMG did that CD deal where it was Is like. Is that the oh. same BMG? Is, yeah. Like a kid with one cent uh, CDs or yeah, something? Yeah, wasn't yeah, yeah. Where you paid a penny like, and got like yeah. 10 CDs. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, of course. And then <laughs> later on, they're like you're getting uh repoed 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Then they own you, right? So right, exactly. Uh, so anyway, they um, my mom got all these CDs constantly. You know, it was like first records: Whitney Houston, Alanis Morissette, Green Day, Bush, Stone Temple Pilots, Nirvana. That era of that CD, like all of our music, was just like early '90s and block CDs. And then uh, I, we found at a thrift store an, uh, a 300 disc CD changer. Wow. Which at the time was still like, they were still being sold at Best Buy. Like to find one at yeah. a thrift store was rare. And so we had one in our house, this um, 300 disc changer. And wow. we had a list of every, all 300 <laughs> CDs that you would zip to. And uh, I knew like front to back, like 300 times 10, probably 3000 songs of 90s music. Um, from each album that all fit in this disc changer and everything else that came after that uh, we just you'd have to pull something out you know put something back in but we had a solid to where we knew where everything was um, and that is wow. the influence of my music uh, to like 90s grunge punk uh, and I don't know playing music no one was really musical in my family either but we sure as shit listened to a lot of it and yeah so here I am trying to recreate 90s grunge punk. You're doing great with that. So <laughs> congratulations. Uh, and, and Ryan, how about you? What are, what are those early influences? Uh, let's see. I mean, early on, I remember I, I stole my dad's Paul Simon Concert in the Park CD. And then my mom's Billy Idol CD were two of my, my favorites. And then I, uh, I also joined the BMG's CD club and started buying my own music. Um, and I, the first CD I bought for myself was Guns N' Roses' Appetite for Destruction, um, nice. which was great. And so then I, I learned like playing drums along to that. Um, and then I kind of got into pop music for a while and then, um, yeah, then like in college, I got into Bright Eyes and um, sort of more like expanded or orchestral indie rock sounds. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I don't know. Then then there's this project, which is which is great and just kind of like stripped down and really s scratches some deep itches. It's amazing. Yeah. We were all part of the same um, folk resurgence in like 2008, 2009, all of our bands. Dorota was in like a two-piece folk metal band. Ryan's band, Blind Pilot. Uh, I mean, in the beginnings, you know, doing tours via bicycle was just like the dream of every folk band at that time. And then our band had a veggie bus and an accordion. And I think that speaks for itself. Um, what, wait, no, it does. So what is a veggie bus? Tell me. You know, me it's a. Uh, like a, a, bus a bus that, that runs, runs on, on biofuel. So okay, you, okay. Like, like you pull up to a Thai so, restaurant and you go in there. And so you, say you have a, a drive for five hours, you need to get from Salt Lake City to Boise or whatever that okay. drive is. And in between, you're going to have to fill up gas twice because this thing has like little to no space of fuel. And so you have, um, instead of a five hour drive, you plan about 10 hours ahead of time. You have to leave uh, all hung over from the Salt Lake City show, even though somehow they don't even sell beer that's not NA. And then, um, and then you, you stop about an hour and a half in and you go and you're just begging people at Chinese restaurants and uh, like fast grills food. and fast food restaurants to use their veggie oil. And then most of them are like, oh no even though they have no idea what you're planning with it, they're like, that's our trash that we have to pay. You know, they have to pay to have somebody come get it. And so yeah. then you go to the next spot and eventually an hour later, someone's like, I don't give a shit. And then you go in there and you dump all this veggie grease in through the window, through a big funnel, through the window of our bus. And it would end up in this big tank made of epoxied wood. And the whole um, bus would smell like French fries and we'd get out of the bus and we'd show up at a show and we'd smell like French fries. And we would be so tired of moving like 60 gallons of just truly french fry grease throughout the day i don't recommend it to anybody but the mid to late 2000s were a glorious time oh how glorious <laughs> it's these things that make you into who you are right yeah and 
And, and while we're talking about cooking a little bit, Stealth, you have a unique talent to be able to make a French omelet while holding a, a, a baby, right? You can. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm glad you saw that. Yeah, you know, what? I'm, I'm really good at making French omelets, I think, in general. It's my go-to breakfast that I can do in a few minutes. Um, that's the thing about the Julie Child's omelet is it's a two-minute omelet as opposed to the English slow push where you're kind of folding it as you go. Um, mm. But the English, they learned patience. We Americans perhaps did not. Um, so I stick with the French, <laughs> the French technique. Uh, the English <laughs> Yeah, I know. And there's a lot of different omelet methods. Is that really what it's called? Yeah. And have you seen, I mean, like the Korean omelet too is incredible because it's fast and it's in a walk and it's constantly moving. Yeah. It's a really incredible omelet method, but I stuck to the French omelet. And uh, when you have a baby, you have to learn to do everything one-handed. I yes. learned all of the countries and all of the capitals because I didn't know what to do on my phone anymore. I was so bored. So I just started memorizing the countries of the world and the capitals. And I think even by the time that I did that a year ago, um, some countries and capitals have changed. So. Wow. Okay. Do you know all the capitals of all the states in the, in the United States? Oh yeah. Okay. There's a song it's that makes Rockapella. Sense. Rockapella. Yeah. The, the, the Carmen San Diego band, right? Oh, I don't know that one. Wait, I know what? the. We're, we're, we're gonna look it up as soon as we get off. I know the. Okay, we know the. Yeah. Um, the. Uh, Animaniacs. Maniacs. Yeah. Batman. Okay. Yeah. 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 Hear it. Who me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the singer okay, in the group. Studio bar. Baton Rouge, Louisiana, Indianapolis, Indiana, and Columbus is the capital of Ohio. Ohio. There's Montgomery, Alabama, South of Helena, Montana. Then there's Denver, Colorado, and there's Boise, Idaho, Texas, <laughs> Boston, <laughs> Maine, New York, to Massachusetts, Boston, and Albany, New York. <laughs> national tennessee yeah. oh that's brilliant oh, Thanks, i Anna. love it <laughs> i know right that was that was great thank you now if um, only like schoolhouse rock taught us all the prepositions that we need to do in the world oh yeah I, that's I like... have a really easy time my memory is like um terrible like i rely on stealth to remember make up everything everything like it's really bad. I think I might have some sort of condition. Hey, no. No, no, no. It's no. chill. Remember that time no, I... the doctor and they said you're all good? Remember? <laughs> How much did you pay him to say that? So and what type but of doctor it... was this? <laughs> um, but um I have a really easy time remembering anything if um it's set to song. Yeah. Um, and so I know a lot of I think you'd remember lyrics better. Hey, I remember lyrics too. Oh. <laughs> You're the one that forgets lyrics. Yeah, well, they're not set to song. Mr. Projector. <laughs> not recommend to anyone listening to this being a married couple. <laughs> right. You, you can't tell at all, right? <laughs> hey, look, they survived COVID, so, you know, I mean, yeah. they got through, that, got through that rough patch. I think no, I can good. figure more with you, Ryan, if you want. Yeah. <laughs> I just feel left out is all. Uh oh, <laughs> well, you just got to spend some time with the Animaniacs and then you're, you know, all, all caught up, right? So, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, so Ryan, I don't want you to feel left out. So I do want to ask you, um, we're talking early pandemic. You, uh, you made it, you embroidered a, st a stoned ice cream cone. Yeah, I did a lot of embroideries. Um, yeah, a lot of people took up sourdough and I took up, um, embroidery with with Lauren and uh so at first like I would do the little drawing and she would do the embroidery um but the drawing wasn't occupying enough of my my time and so yeah we would just sit there and, and embroider together and it was it was really quite sweet um and yeah I mean it was fun to do like uh, stuff that you wouldn't maybe normally see embroidered like a stoned ice cream cone uh, which was which was good there's another there was a parachuting mouse with his hands cut off and blood squirting out of his stumpy arms that was another <laughs> good embroidery um we got you know, yeah <laughs> i still don't know how to make sourdough but i'm pretty good at embroidery if you need anything done yeah but but you're really into art as well and you're i mean uh, you're an artist of sorts right so how long have you been doing that um i've i mean kind of 
my my whole life i guess my mom was a a working artist and so just pretty much every day after school i would hang out in her studio and just kind of try to copy what she would make and then i would make my own things using supplies that were always abundant in the house which was really great and then uh yeah, I went to the University of Oregon and studied painting there um, and was, um, yeah, trying to make it as a painter in Portland for a few years before music started becoming the, the main thing. Um, but I always go back to painting when I'm not touring, um, which, is, which is nice. Sometimes I uh, can feel like a, a little torn, like I'm not diving in one thing or the other deep enough but i can't let go of either so i just have to have to make it work it would make time for both passions that's a that's a good thing yeah yeah yeah, uh, yeah painting was always like uh it, as a kid people would ask what i wanted to be when i grew up and i said that i wanted to be in a band and they would be like, oh that's great you should have a backup plan so i made oil painting my backup plan which Super is practical so do you have an, do you have another backup plan or no <laughs> no uh because the thing about backup plans is that that's what you usually end up doing so if yeah you should um you know have a sweet backup plan um yeah to your yeah, what's to it? your lofty first plan i would say yeah um so you you guys have an interesting story kind of to the start of I, I think it, you guys started right around the beginning of COVID. Is that right? Or that's right. We that's um we recorded the first two songs on the record before right before COVID. We just were all on tour together. Um and booked a day in the studio just for fun and recorded two songs. And then COVID happened, and then we were like, hey, let's make a whole record. So it was like, yeah, right at the beginning of COVID. Yeah, then one nice thing is we had friends with really nice studios and they were all getting, they were all so booked up all the time, but then COVID happened and they all got canceled. So our friend Parker in Nashville, he was like, look, this place is just empty. If you guys want to feel like trekking out here. We were so afraid of flying, you know, and, and so we drove from, um, we drove from California, picked Ryan up in, uh, Ryan uh, and Lauren in, in Colorado. And then kept going to Nashville and we didn't have any heat in the van, you know, it was like 105 out here in any air conditioning, sorry. And we, yeah. so we had this, um, Mr. Manager, Mr. Manager, where we just had a spray bottle where if you just constantly sprayed yourself down, it would actually be really refreshing with the windows open and you couldn't hear anyone talk because the windows. Are... So, um, we got there in what felt like eternity and, uh, the point when Lauren put mint uh oh that was nice essential oil in the mister and it burned our eyes we didn't know we just sprayed it straight into the eyeball so it was a good time but it, that yeah. I think is why we were able to record with such like finding such an incredible uh engineer and work in an incredible studio like um with, with Parker Kiss on at Creative Workshop in Nashville which is one of their oldest studios that's up on Berry Hill um and his father is like a renowned uh, engineer and producer from working back with like to Elvis and Patsy Cline and uh, Linda Ronstadt and all this. Oh, um, and then That's we cool. we finally um, get around to finishing this record and, and he had all these connections. So mastering with Pete Lyman was uh, also a really uh, fortunate uh, dip in the like handover to be able to work with somebody who's mastered like a ton of amazing records, grant, Grammy winning records the, that just come out sounding. So that yeah, I know. all I think is the real story. I think this is to say like pandemic didn't bring us together but it did give us maybe these opportunities that uh, we didn't have beforehand. Uh, yeah, well, so, so long. Everyone else's loss. <laughs> Sorry, and, keep going. It's okay. And along the way you were playing, like you played socially just in shows, right? Like you were playing your music uh, to, to folks along the way, right? Yeah, well, uh, Dorota and I, uh, that was like the first summer of pandemic. And around that time, yeah, we, 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 um, we started doing these, we made a stage that popped down from our, from our van and we could just play and we didn't, 
we just had a friend play bass, this Lady of Eva. So we were doing that under a name, Secret Pluto Band. But that is where some of these songs first started too. We were just playing them oh, yeah. then before they'd kind of come into fruition. Yeah, I don't know if we did any of those on the way out to Nashville, but we were doing it right around the same time. Um, we do these like, yeah, we call them socially distant shows, but a lot of the time we just pull up to someone's house and just play to like their household outside um, or like whatever people's bubble was. Um, no, we'd put our Venmo up and got paid better than almost any bar show I've ever played. Yeah. It, it worked, huh? So. They were desperate for it. <laughs> hey, people needed music then, you know, and it's it was hard to come by. Yeah, concerts also not happening. So yeah, I mean, any any live music was, was great for sure. Yeah, it was um, fun. Yeah. So, uh, so the new album Notions, um, it, it's coming out August 5th. Uh, let's talk about a couple of the songs. Um, Weird, Sad Symbol, uh, you wrote while living in Santa Cruz uh, here in California. Yeah, I lived in Santa Cruz for, I don't know, 12 years or so, um, which is like a beautiful, beautiful place that is also really expensive. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, um, yeah, when I wrote that song, Stealth and I were living in a garage um, in a house that we shared with like five other people that we had to like leave the garage to go inside to use the bathroom. Um, wow. And that song. It's this funny. is only like four years ago. Yeah, it was not that long ago. <laughs> now we pay like the same amount to live in a house. Um, <laughs> We've come, we're moving up in the world, right? Yeah, yeah. But um yeah that song is kind of just about uh it was like a like fun loose stream of consciousness writing um and yeah I, the house that i lived in before that was a similar situation with just like a, a million people and the house was like a hundred plus years old but had a crazy rat infestation and that was like the the like subplot that dominated our lives for two years we all became like crazy rat obsessed people oh man not um, good obsessed with killing rats yeah yeah yeah, yeah not um, not with bringing them in and, or having them nope, cook for you or no no it was and it started out we were like let's do live traps and like set them free elsewhere that, those are not good i'll tell you yeah, yeah no I, they're not yeah. and no. uh yeah, I've tried every method, plus some that you've probably never thought of. Um, but that's, uh, there's got, like some- I, I visited the house and they had two snake cages that sometimes <laughs> would get out and just slither back into the cage two days later. So full of just like rat lumps inside of them. I got two pythons because I was like desperate. <laughs> <laughs> you needed to these rats to go somewhere and yeah, uh, yeah. and they yeah. did escape their cage and eat the rats. Did you have a lazy cat at one point? No, we needed a lazy cat. Oh. Oh. There was a visiting lazy cat that didn't visit for long enough. Um, but anyway, the, there's a little bit of that mentioned in it that was, song. It was also <laughs> our first exploration in uh, sharing lyrics and writing a song together. Yeah, that's true. Which is for all the couples writing music out there. Uh, fucking difficult um, but has you, easier with time yeah do you sit down in the same room or do you separate and come come together with the, the lyrics what works better we did both um on this record we it was kind of songs that we brought and started to mesh them like this and somebody would say eh, i don't know about this lyric and the other person would say well i uh, really like it and they'd say well um i don't really like it and then we would um three days later come out of like a smoke build war-torn household and and be like you're right yeah. the sky is blue is a stupid lyric <laughs> yeah and, and it came together and so so let's talk about dinner for breakfast then uh first of all a lot of people might eat breakfast for dinner but i don't know a lot of people that eat dinner for breakfast uh this is long-term long-distance relationship is there different time zones involved here or what are, what are we talking um dinner for breakfast was a song I wrote while Stealth was on tour and I just missed him. <laughs> uh, so it's a song about like we had just moved here um, to 
to the Eastern Sierra and I didn't know anyone. And, uh, and then so immediately went on tour and I just was sort of alone in this new place and just going through the motions of being alive and making food for yourself. And then just like eating the same meal for three days in a row because you live alone and what else are you gonna do? Um, yeah, just a little song about longing. Yeah. And hope, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, well, there's another song about longing in uh, on the album too. Uh, and that's Breathe is like uh, about your hometown of uh, Bishop, right? Yeah. Um, go ahead, rub it in. All our songs are about longing. <laughs> it's just about longing and wanting these, longing, these things. Longing. Nostalgia. <laughs> um, yeah, Breathe came around the same time that that song was written and it was um yes me that, being home stealth being on tour all the time and me being sad about it and then stealth wrote that song to it, make me feel better yeah it was a lot it was a good it was a good song this backyard that we're in right now mm -hmm. uh, that's filled with trash as you can see and weeds the entire space here was filled with watermelons one seed one seed provided us with possibly how many 30 40 yeah. 30 or 40 watermelons. Um, wow. Wow. And there was this thing where I was like, man, nowhere else can you just accidentally have, and that was just a new thing. And the whole, um, after we pick them all and we move all the, we take all the vines away after all the watermelons were through. The, um, our backyard is The just entire thing concrete. was coated in um, sugar. And I didn't know that this, that watermelons sweat sugar in this way. So there was this wow. really wow. sweet, um, yeah, your feet were just truly like sticky, the whole thing in a gross way. But um, I think that line is in Breathe. I, I yeah. wrote it with all these like uh, vignettes and homages of, I would dumpster dive from the grocery store uh, and I would bring all this fruit over to the horses and I would feed them. And they're all these- Because there are just horses and mules like everywhere. Stray dogs. In town. And, yeah. Constantly trying to just learn this new life that was very different than Santa Cruz where we'd been prior, so. Yeah. The, the lyrics in that song are very, uh, they're very unique, uh, for sure. And uh, I mean, it's, it's visual. They're, it's a very visual song. You paint a good picture with, uh, uh, with Breathe, I'll say. So. It's a bit of a wordsmith. Yeah, yes. Uh, I like it. Uh, well, Ryan, Ryan uh, I don't want to leave you out. It's, it's been a few minutes since you <laughs> been uh, asked anything. So t t tell me kind of the status of uh, Blind Pigs and how, uh, you know, in that project. A uh, uh, blind pilot now. Blind pilot. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, blind pilot. We have a, a handful of shows coming up in July, and then we're talking to some producers now to work on our next album, um, which will be fun. That's been a long time coming, um, and yeah, that's like that's sort of the the status of of blind pilot at the moment. Um, so a, a few things on, on the horizon, which is good. It'll be, feel great to get into the studio. Always love, love recording and, um, yeah, just making stuff feels, feels good. Yeah. And, and you guys did shows recently with, uh, with Magic Giant, right? Yeah. So tell me about that. I mean, they are such a great live band, you know, I've interviewed them a, uh, one or two times, I think, and they're, I mean, for, they were they were this band. the The year that I saw them first, I'm like, this band is amazing, and it's going going places. I mean, just their energy and connection to their fans is really cool. I met I met Austin, so he's he um he's a Colorado guy, or he went to school there at least at CU Boulder when he was doing the uh, the Voice or what was it, American America's American Idol. I think he was on. Mm, yeah. it. And he, from Boulder, CU, so he's like a hometown hero in some ways, but. Uh, then I was in the Lumineers 2013, played the Grammys. I went to an after party and it was at P. Diddy's mansion in the hills. And there were like cascading pools, you know, a hot tub that went into a bigger swimming pool that went into a bigger swimming wow, pool. Wow, you're so cool. <laughs> <laughs> name, name drop, name drop. Yeah. 
and, uh, we the name dropping segment of the interview. Here, let me pick that up for you. No. <laughs> yeah, I met Kelly Clarkson one time. Just going to throw it in there. So it's somewhere in the podcast. Okay, go on. Yeah, no, what is this? I don't know. Uh, Any name in your bro? No, she was on American Idol. She was Shoot. the first winner of American Idol. Really? Yeah. Okay, well, Austin did not win. <laughs> um, didn't win, no. So I'm like, I can't, like, this is probably the last time I'm going to be in, like, such a, like, have an opportunity to actually act like a rock star because, like, the Lumineers is very wholesome. Every band I've been in prior is very wholesome. Uh, no matter how hard we try it's really hard to actually put on like the Mick Jagger front. So uh, I strip down uh, and I jump from pool to pool at this mansion and I'm the only one swimming and I'm like, come on, you fucking slags. You know, I'm yelling at everyone that they're no fun and they're all in their Grammy, post Grammy tuxedos. And then everybody got in the pool and started a pool party. And with clothes on, I was just the weird naked dude. Anyway, fast forward like four years. And uh, this guy comes up to me at a festival and he's like, hey, uh, you know, I only saw you naked and from behind, but you're stealth, right? Like you were at this party. And I was like, yeah. And he was like, yeah, I was there. Uh, it's good to meet you with clothes on. Uh, my name's Austin. And he likes know, being and naked a lot too, from friendship. what I've seen. So, you know, I think you're in good company. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. He, he does seem to... Uh, the, the social media you never get the full he's really good at the, uh, <laughs> the angles <laughs> angles it's everything but anyway that's how we met and uh above all when you're playing shows with people i think um you know we're not as much in like the vocal pop world their band is just like if you took three hype men from all these different projects and you put them into one project and it's just all hype um and so yeah they have an incredible energy we have a lot to show. learn still with our hype man qualities. Um, and it was really fun to play the shows with them. Uh, our last show with them in Denver, um, I stepped in human shit in the alley and um, a drunk lady tried to take Casper from Dorota to hold Casper while you were in the van and then refused to drink. Asked if you had any booze, but she then came you into the van and was like, mad you got any you had drinks? Was milk? And I said, no, I don't have anything. And she said, just mama's milk left. Mad. So uh, this all just, I'm just, just saying this was what happened at the last show with them. His people were, it was the same day as <laughs> Colorado Rockies opening day. So everyone on this. We should, was we should clarify these, these <laughs> aren't magic giant fans. <laughs> these, are, these are Colorado Rocky like stragglers. <laughs> there's there's some overlap at all, or you know? yeah. <laughs> no, they yeah. just happen to also be in the alley where we were parked. <laughs> so and so when when this lady asked for the mama's milk, you didn't provide any mama's milk, right? Like you're like, nope, that's that's staying here. I did not okay. provide the mama's milk. The mama's Dorota, milk. It, you know, among a good party, okay, her, like one of these party tricks. You know, I mean, she'll be at a wedding full of strangers. They're she doesn't not strangers. Know. Anyway, and she can this is, launch hey, mama's milk what? across the across like Stop. six tables. I would never. Come on, show it on the podcast. I would never. No one's gonna be able to see anything. It's just audio. Okay, here, here you go. Wow, boy, did it <laughs> go a, far. A, that was amazing. That was, that was amazing. amazing. <laughs> Uh, we're sorry for uh, ruining your podcast. It's it's okay. I got a I got a squeaky. So. It's okay. I got a. <laughs> <laughs> good good times. Um. So so obviously Lumineers tour. I mean, you have a big big tour uh, that's that's taking up a lot of your time. I mean, so uh, the this band's uh, stuff is kind of sprinkled in between that, right? Like one off sideshows at this point. One off side shows, we're doing a couple um, short strings of shows in the time off, um, but we don't have any like big chunks of touring planned. We just kind of pepper it in. Fair, fair. Um, and and stealth, can you tell can you tell me kind of your experience? I mean, uh, you know, I mean, the Lumineers is a whole nother podcast, but um, but tell me just briefly your experience joining the Lumineers and the experience getting to play with those guys. Um, 
yeah, I, I met them in the same way that I met uh, both of these two, which is just like doing the grind and touring around. And they, they moved to uh, Denver and they had asked a bunch of people in town if they, uh, as for suggestions of places to play um, and on MySpace they wrote. And so I was one of the only ones to write them back and we became fast friends. Um, I remember your MySpace. <laughs> yep, I had a MySpace, as did all of us. Don't act above it. No, no, I'm not acting above it. I just uh, was thinking about when I met you, it was around the same era and we connected via MySpace. As were, you, were you in his top eight or? Just, you know, were you in his top eight or? I never made it in there, no. <laughs> exactly. Um, so yeah, we, we uh, I started from that little point with them busking and um, playing in little bars and shouting at people and spilling drinks and standing on counters. And um, I've always made, maybe if they're not gonna proclaim it, I'll self-proclaim that I had to fill the role as their hype man. Um, I think they would admit that. Well, now they're all pretty hypey, but they've all gotten better at hype. Jerry yes. was great hype. Yes. Um, but yeah, so I've, I've just been uh, in, now it's like 11 years almost of being in the band. So it's been great. Uh, That's awesome. Through that, yeah, I'd met Dorota before that in my old band. So my old band was called Dovekins. And hmm. we were like a busking, traveling in a veggie bus band. And I think that looked to people who didn't know how to tour really looked like we had it figured out um so they were asking us like yo where are all the stops like what do you do like how are you finding places to sleep and we were just so scuzzy you know we were not ever afraid to just be on stage and be like hey we will like we're the best at cleaning dishes we will like clean your house if you let us stay at your house you know like to a random crowd in san francisco um you know it's funny i was thinking about um back in the day and our friend Shenandoah, who also used to tour a lot, I remember her telling me that she would make a spreadsheet of their tour, and in the spreadsheet, she would write where they were going to stay yeah. on each of the nights, and I remember at the time being like, wow, that's crazy. You plan that instead of just, like, figuring it out during your set? Mm -hmm. um, exactly. Which... How do you know where you're gonna stay ahead of time? <laughs> yeah, there's no way to there's no way to do that. You know, I'm like, oh, she had it together. <laughs> it's planning, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and so, talking about you mentioned San Francisco. Um, I'm curious, what's a memorable uh, story you have from playing a show in the Bay Area? Oh, 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 oh. so many. Um, I'm trying to think if we've played one there together though. That's worthwhile. Last time we played there was with secret Pluto band with our little side thing. And it was the morning Dorota found out she was pregnant and mm. we just had to go and play our shows. And we played out back of this liquor store in Berkeley, um, which makes it sound, it's a nice liquor store. And, it, it is, say, yes. and he said, it, you can it, take it, over yes. and you can invite everybody, you know, it will be spacious. And we also played a show up in the Hills where we just said, Hey, everybody, meet us at um what's that redwood park that's outside of the um mere woods um mere woods yeah right out there uh be like this is the pull-off like everybody meet us there and we're just gonna play an acoustic show there and it was like 60 people it was amazing yeah i was like um, right at the trailhead and we set up little lights yeah. it was so nice so it, san francisco allows for that um, I lived in Oakland for years and I lived in the inner sunset as well for, for a year and, um, and slowly like there and Santa Cruz, you know, had just played so many shows. Remember when we played in San Francisco at that, um, for profit, nonprofit house, no, that for profit <laughs> commune. That was crazy. That was like the most San tech thing I've ever seen. And I just didn't <laughs> even know it, that tech was a thing at the time. Yeah, it was like a, a commune, a communal like, living house for profit. But they always specified for profit, <laughs> <laughs> and so that was very SF. One time, I slept underneath the grand piano that we played there. Um, would you know the uh, you know the uh, what's that that area that Casey worked at? 
out in the across the bridge behind Sausalito. Um, the, uh, oh, point, no. not Bolinas, but um, starts with an M. Marin. Marin. Yeah, you know the Marin Headlands. Yes, um, I think we're in there. Yeah. Yeah, playing there and uh, being on psychedelics and the whole like magical valley of eucalyptus that's there and that beach with the, it's got the um, the vet with all the sea lions in it up there that are barking away. It's a really mm -hmm. nice place, but no, San Francisco has like a lot of memories for me. And I think because her and I had like met in that area for both of us, like having yeah. played there a lot. What about you, Ryan? Yeah. Um, my favorite was probably the um, Blind Pilot Bicycle Tour and it was, which we did shortly after our first album came out and this was like pre smartphone so we couldn't really tell what was going on but we had like booked shows in the bigger cities and then you could only bike maybe 60 70 miles in a day so there's a lot of like camping or small towns and you just sort of you know you'd say like hey like we're gonna play at campsite 23 if anyone wants to come but then uh, like we roll into San Francisco and we have an actual show at uh, Mojo Bicycle Cafe, which I don't think is there anymore. I'm not positive, um, but it was a very cool place. Uh, as like a bike shop cafe that would have shows. Um, and we had just been camping. We were super tired and sweaty, but then when we got there, it was like, it was full of people and it kind of like blew our mind we had no idea that like our record was even like doing in anything um outside of like us selling it basically door to door from our bikes um and so that was that was really cool and just the the energy in in that room and I remember it was like it was a really like, funny like name drop but it was enough to make me nervous it was like the son of the keyboardist from talking heads the the guy in the stop me yes video who like does all the really cool faces and dance moves um yeah but he he was at the show and that like that's one of my favorite concerts and concert videos of all time so even just jerry just, harrison right yeah, yeah. We're, we're going to reboot the router now. Or, oh, we're going in the refresh now. <laughs> the now. We're no. going in the refresh. It got too hot. <laughs> this, is easy, this is easily my favorite interview. Oh, no. <laughs> is it working now? I, I, it is. It is. Yeah. So we'll do the second half of the interview now. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I got that out there. The rest of the interview is going to be in the fringe. Yes. Oh, so, no. oh yes. Oh, now you're just teasing. No, I need an it's it. San Francisco treat. It's San Francisco it. treat. Right? Seriously. No, I I live fairly close to an it's it factory, so I could I could make that happen. Uh, dumpster? Do dump? Wait. How do you dumpster ice cream? In the winter. Oh, they don't have winter. You have to mm -hmm. dumpster in the summer. No, San Francisco is always winter. Mark yeah. Twain said. The coldest it's that I have ever had was <laughs> dumpstered in San Francisco. <laughs> he did, did he? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I want to I want to congratulate you guys on the new album. Um, it is really great, and uh, and I, the dynamic that you guys built uh, with it is awesome. I hope to see you uh, out in the Bay Area playing a, a show. Um, I know you have some dates in early August for, for Lumineers, but you're playing probably a little bit bigger venue for, for that one. So, um, oh, we might play, but, out, we might play secret Pluto band out back of this liquor store. I'm serious. Um, in San Francisco, let's stay in touch. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we'll is get, that, is that real? We'll get, a, we'll get a heavy gush show there for sure. Yeah. What well, during your day? So when you're in the Bay area. Gives. Um, yeah. Probably. Well, we'll we'll see. It's yes. it's it's hard to sneak those heavy gush shows into the middle of a tour. We kind of try to do them just before or just 
after. And San Francisco is right in the middle of the Lumineers tour. So it is. But it'll it'll happen. San Francisco's top of the list. I like it. Yeah. So you, you all have connection to San Francisco. Don't forget the Bay Area. You know, we uh, uh, we love you out here. So uh, thanks for taking the time to do the interview, both outdoors and in your refrigerator. That's, I mean, a unique experience that, you know, I've never had before. So I, I appreciate it. Uh, you guys are great. It was a lot of fun. You're, you're hilarious. And, uh, uh, and yeah, hopefully we'll be catching you soon. Have, yeah. a, have a cool. Yeah. Thank you for the kind words. Yeah, have a have a cool afternoon, and Ryan, thanks for being with me along that road as, yeah, as well. Yeah. <laughs> it was entertaining. Yeah, I hope you guys have a good one. Okay. All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you, guys. That was the interview with heavy guests here on Concert Pipeline, and that takes us to the final segment on the program: the music news. <laughs> I have a couple stories to wind out the program here today. What's going on in the music world? Uh, an update on Axl Rose. Um, he's, uh, he took to social media to update his fans on his health following the band's last minute uh, cancellation of their concert in Glasgow. Uh, he shared the following message. I'd like to thank everyone for their well wishes. It's greatly appreciated. We apologize for the inconvenience of postponing Glasgow. I've been following doctor's orders, getting rest, working with a vocal coach and sorting out our sound issues. Seems good so far. Thanks for everyone's concern. At the end of the day, it's about giving the fans the best of ourselves and the times uh, we can uh, give you and that all. I don't know what he's writing. He gets, you know, rambling. The band and crew are focused on. Uh, the band said at the time of cancellation, sadly due to illness and medical advice, GNR will not be able to perform in Glasgow. So then they're working on rescheduling options. This is a big turn. This is a big turn. I mean, we've seen a big change in terms of Axl Rose and his, uh, his band and their dynamic over the recent years, right? Uh, I mean, I saw Guns N' Roses in 2000 and, oh man, it must have been 2005 uh, that I saw them. And they took to the stage two hours after the uh, opening act got off. So we were just sitting and waiting for hours and hoping that they would show. Uh, he and the current band at that time did show. Uh, it was just during the Chinese Democracy Tour. They did show and they played and it was a, a solid set. But, um, but th th that was during his time of canceling many, many shows, not showing up, uh, you know, and lots of protests. I mean, you know, people are a fan of that band and he did not have a good reputation, but he change that reputation uh, and uh and has put on great shows i mean seeing him play bottle rock last year in napa was an amazing experience it was really cool especially because he brought out dave Grohl at the end which was awesome so uh so very cool i hope he's uh he's resting up and and we'll get better soon speaking of not doing well uh tom jones denied collapsing ahead of uh postponed budapest show um, he shared an update on his health after he was forced to postpone a show uh, that he had been uh, due to perform at the Hungarian capital as part of his current European and UK tour, uh, but the concert was canceled last minute. Uh, he issued a statement on social media in the early hours of uh, the morning uh, to shut down reports that he had collapsed uh, ahead of the show. Uh, he said, I did not collapse anywhere at any time, he wrote, that is pure rumor. Explaining the reason for the postponement, he said, I traveled last night from the UK to Budapest and woke this morning with an uncomfortable throat. A specialist came to visit and diagnosed viral laryngitis. That doesn't sound too good. He strongly advised postponing this evening's show and prescribed medication and vocal rest. He continued on, hopefully the inflammation will calm soon as I am looking forward to continuing my wonderful summer tour. Unfortunately, the show uh, had to be canceled at the last minute. And for that, I'm very sorry. Thanks again for your kind concern. All right. Well, hopefully Tom Jones as well will get some rest and, and feel better. Um, here's a story. Three men are charged in a conspiracy to sell stolen Eagle lyrics. Uh, and so th they, these are handwritten notes and lyrics by the Eagles co-founder, Don Henley. Uh, Glenn Horowitz, Edward uh, Kaczynski, and Rock and Roll Hall of Fame curator Craig 
uh, in Ciardi had been accused of attempting to sell handwritten notes and lyrics from Hotel California and Life in the Fast Lane, uh, with officials estimating the documents worth at, uh, at over $1 million. Three men, including a curator for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I will emphasize again, that is interesting. Like he doesn't have enough cool stuff at the Rock and Roll, his whole place is full of cool rock and roll stuff. Why does he need to steal shit? Uh, they were charged or for uh, possessing a trove of stolen handwritten notes and lyrics by Don Henley. Uh, Henley has been trying to recover the documents for years after they were stolen in the 1970s. And according to officials, pawned off to Horowitz in 2005. Uh, these three alle then allegedly began selling to various auction houses as well as trying to coerce Henley into buying them back. Oh my gosh, this is dark. Like you hear, buy your own shit back, good luck. Uh, you know, oh my God, I can't even imagine. Uh, each of the men have been charged with one count of conspiracy in the fourth degree, while Horowitz faces a first degree ch uh, charge for attempted criminal possession of stolen property and two counts of hindering uh, prosecution. Um, yeah, according to Rolling Stone, NCRD has been suspended from his role at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. You think? That's a good call. Uh, President and CEO Joel Parishman uh, told board members in a letter, at this time, we do not know whether Craig engaged in any wrongdoing. He will remain on the pending the resolution of the third party internal investigation and the extent of the charges once the indictment is sealed. Uh, so uh, really, really interesting story. Just like, I can't even imagine someone from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame stealing you know, rock memorabilia. Like, we need this for the rock and roll Hall of Fame. This really belongs here. I I'll go ahead and take it. Or, but it doesn't even sound like he was taking it for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He was trying to sell it for money. Uh, it's nuts. Uh, anyway, uh, last story for the day. Uh, and that is uh, Zach De La Roche, uh, Rage Against the Machines uh, singer, performed while sitting down after in, uh, injuring, injuring his leg at the Rage Against the Machine reunion show. Uh, so Rage Against the Machine postponed their shows uh, when COVID hit. Um, we actually, I actually had tickets to go see him with my buddy Joe, um, and uh, they were one of the first tours to get canceled. I mean, this was supposed to happen in April of 2020. It was like right after COVID started, and Ticketmaster put up a fuss over that originally wouldn't give refunds for the shows that were postponed indefinitely. Uh, we had to force the issue. Anyway, uh, they postponed, and two years later, finally rescheduling two, two and a half years actually, finally rescheduling the shows. I guess they just started off in Chicago uh, and Zach De La Roche appeared to injure his leg and after leaving the stage for a short while, finished the rest of his set while seated. According to reports on social media, De La Roche sustained the injury during the band's fourth song, Bullet in the Head. Uh, uh, returning to the stage after a short break, he said, I don't know what happened to my leg right now. Uh, straight up, but you know what? We're going to keep this fucking shit going. I can crawl across this stage. We're going to play for you all tonight uh, before they uh, started playing Testify. He then performed the rest of the set while sitting on an onstage monitor. And when he did stand, it looked like he couldn't put any weight on the leg. Interesting. Uh, they have um, they had another show uh, last night at the East Chicago's United Center uh, as part of their lengthy public service announcement tour. Uh, they're yet to comment on the injury or how it will affect the rest of the tour. So, uh, but people were pretty impressed with him. The show must go on, right? Yes, I mean, this time it did. Two and a half years ago, it did COVID and all that jazz. And they held out uh, until uh, things were much better. So um, that is it. That is our show. Thank you to Heavy Gus for being on the program. Uh, we have more fun interviews coming up around the quarter. We have Aeon Station. As I mentioned, we have Everclear. We have other interviews being set up. Uncle Barn, the Dirty Bastard, She Wants Revenge, so much more. Uh, so thank you for tuning in. Uh, like, subscribe, comment, uh, all of the fun stuff. Uh, tell your friends. Um, it all really helps. Uh, give, us, give us some five-star rating on Apple Music. Why not? You know, what's that going to hurt? It's not, right? It's not going to hurt anything. Let's go ahead and do it. Um, all right. Well, thank you for tuning in. Uh, and for all of us here at Concert Pipeline, I'm Steve Jones. We'll catch you next time.